In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us of all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our service continues with the hymn. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 5. Are we doing 1, 2, and 5? Verses 1, 2, and 5. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I'm ready. the King, all glorious above, all great for thee see, God's power and love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, a brilliant in splendor, and girded with praise. The earth with its soar of wonders untold, Almighty your power has founded of old, established it fast by a changeless degree, and round it has cast like a mantle the sea. O measureless might, ineffable love, while angels delight to him you above. The humble creation grew feeble their lays with true adoration shall sing to your praise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. O God of power and might, your Son shows us the way of service, and in him we inherit the riches of your grace. Give us the wisdom to know what is right and the strength to serve the world you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our service continues with the reading or with the mission minute, but a quick announcement. Um, we'll, you know, let's forego the quick announcement in favor of, of moving on to the mission minute. All right. Greetings to you, siblings in Christ. This was a busy week for the racial advocacy team, which is comprised of Amanda Zoss, Chris Swarczyk, and myself. And any of you are welcome to participate as well. Um, we learned a few things this week. We learned about the ELCA strategy toward authentic diversity, something that the ELCA churchwide body has been working on 
for many years, um, dating back to the first um, multicultural mission strategy in 1991. And then they recommitted to that strategy in 1997. And then fast forward to 2019, uh, one of the bishops' councils, it was reported that only 25 synods in the United States had done any work towards diversity strategizing. The Minneapolis Area Synod was one of them. Um, that took place in 2016 at our synod assembly. Um, and that's where the racial justice liaison Alita, can you tell us team the, the came from jumping? or was born from memorials that were passed there. Is it work? Are the videos going through? Um, we also had the opportunity this but week to attend Leading plans. with Love Beyond Prison Walls. And again, this is a racial but justice those green bars issue. Are the green bars right um, we know that um, many For people who have been in prison, um, either the laws are not clear or they're too stringent or um, it's complicated. But at any rate... Um, in this last President legislation legislative session, um, House File 40 was passed by the House of Representatives. Um, it was a um, bipartisan 35 author bill um, stating that it, it is a civil right to vote beyond incarceration. So returning residents or people who have come out of prison um, have the civil right to vote. Unfortunately, the um, Minnesota Senate, um, their bill only had five authors and was not bipartisan, and it did not pass. So that is continuing work for residents of Minnesota. Um, when you consider that 35 or 34 percent of the black population in Minnesota is disenfranchised. Um, they cannot vote. Um, that's over 15,000 humans that cannot vote. Um, and other states allow voting from prison even. Um, there's work to do in understanding this and in coming to um, changes uh, for the common good. So the other thing we learned was the recidivism rate. So people who get out of prison and then end up back in prison is 25% in Minnesota. That is high. And we need to do some thinking about that. So as we move forward um, with the First Lutheran Racial Justice Team, and again, you're all invited to join us for those conversations, just give me a call or text or email and let me know that you are interested. Um, and look for the four-part conversation on the ELCA social statement, Freed in Christ, Race, Ethnicity, and Culture, which will happen later in January. Thanks. Reading from Ezekiel, the 34th chapter. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the watercourses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, 
and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself would judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock and they shall no longer be ravaged. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Rejoice for Christ is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. Our Savior Jesus reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our saints, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules for earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus give. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. Sits at God's right hand till all his foes submit and bow to his command and fall beneath his feet. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I Reading from Ephesians, the first chapter. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that, with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for all who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head 
over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. servant is listening you have the words of eternal love alleluia 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 The gospel this morning is from Matthew, the 25th chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. Jesus said to the disciples, when the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the throne of glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left, and then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord. When was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison or visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you. Just as you did it to the least of these who are a member of my family, so you did it to me. And then he will say to those at his right hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or a sick or in prison and did not care for you? And then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go into eternal punishment and the righteous into eternal light. This is the gospel of our Lord. Well, I think you've got a sense that this morning was, has been just a little bit different than uh, we might have planned a week or two ago. This is this stuff is getting serious, the the virus and that sort of thing. And so uh, you've noticed probably that Deacon is at home, and um, yeah, it's it's getting close. And so we're we're keeping in prayer all of those folks who are uh, experiencing that right now. Happy to have Peter back singing with us, and uh, glad that we can continue to worship safely from home at a distance. Well, we've been patiently working through these final days and final sayings of Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew. And as you might recall, Jesus has finished his day teaching, preaching, healing, and debating at the temple. And tomorrow, in the story, Jesus will be arrested. But tonight, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives and he's talking to the disciples. And if you'll remember back almost a chapter and a half ago in Matthew 24, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, Tell us, when will this be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And that has launched Jesus into a series of parables about apocalypse and the end of things and judgment. And that is what we're wrapping up today. Today we arrive at these, the last of these sayings of Jesus in Matthew 25, when Jesus comes to a crescendo and he gives the disciples an image 
that gathers so many of the different lessons that Jesus has been teaching even as far back as the Sermon on the Mount. It even starts to begin to foreshadow what's coming for Jesus. Jesus' arrest, his trial and crucifixion here in the coming days. So what does he do? Jesus starts by giving us an image of gathering every people and nation gathered before the throne. I have an image for this, and I'm hoping that it's up. Um, It's an image that would have been familiar to his listeners, an image that Isaiah uses in the Old Testament, an image that we hear again in Revelation, people of every nation, every tribe, every race, and economic class are gathered there. It's the whole flock. Jesus has done this in so many other parables too, hasn't he? The weeds grow together with the wheat. The bridesmaids all fall asleep together, waiting. Here, just like in flocks, the world over the sheep and the goats have been birthed together in the spring. They've been brought to pasture together. They've grown side by side without distinction. And honestly, This is the part of the parable that's probably most familiar because the emphasis always gets put on the first half of the parable. We want to know, am I a sheep or a goat? We want to know if we're in or we're out. We want to know how we're going to do because our instinct is always to look out for number one. In the end, the sheep didn't actually know that they were sheep. In the end, the goats didn't know that they were goats. And from the throne, Jesus says, Come, you who are blessed, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. You gave me clothing. You took care of me. You visited me in prison. Even then, the sheep didn't know they were sheep and the goats didn't know that they were goats. And so, even those sheep, those sheep began by asking, When did we see you? And Jesus replies, just as you did it to the least of these members of my family, you did it to me. And even then, the sheep didn't know they were sheep. And the goats didn't know that they were goats. Those goats who had been separated to the left asked, when did we see you? And Jesus answers again, you saw someone who was hungry and gave no food and food or thirsty and gave no drink. A stranger and gave no welcome and one in need of clothing who remained naked, in need of a care of, for, or a visit and all left alone. And I get so frustrated because even after a close reading of this parable, I feel like I get to the end and I still don't know if I'll be among the sheep or the goats. I don't know if I'm doing enough. Jesus' servants never knew they were in Jesus' presence all along, and they keep asking, when, when did we see you? You know, soon after Mother Teresa died, an NPR interviewer uh, interviewed one of their own correspondents. Sandy Broy grew up attending one of those Jesuit schools in Calcutta and occasionally visited Mother Teresa's order, the Sister of Mercy, the ministries that they managed. And he looked back and he remembered her and he said, I wish I could say that Mother Teresa glowed with a special radiance, but she didn't. She always seemed so busy. She was wiping someone's nose, patting someone's head, chatting with the priests in India. We were surrounded by poverty, but there was a kind of glass wall between those of us in the middle class and the lives of the people in the cardboard shacks on the street. And so we would roll up our windows in the car that took us to school. We learned to look through the beggars who approached us at traffic intersections. It was a way to avoid being crushed by all of the poverty that surrounded us. But Mother Teresa seemed to gather the poverty and disease that swirled around us into the folds of her sari, and for a moment, She let it actually touch our lives. Now we hear about her newly published letters written to some of the same priests who taught the speaker in Calcutta, and they describe her own spiritual doubts, and I'm not completely surprised. The world around made her a saint, turned her into postcards and amulets, but the true miracle of Mother Teresa 
was that even in the midst of her own crisis of faith, she gave us faith. She gave meaning to the old toys we brought to the orphanage and our pocket change and packets of milk and biscuits, and she taught even little sheltered kids like us to see how desperate other people's lives were and to care. Remember how I mentioned that this is a parable that gathers up so many of Jesus' teachings and so many of these actions of Jesus throughout Matthew. As we look back on Jesus' ministry, Jesus and the disciples were on the road and spent their ministry relying on hospitality, relying on the care of others. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus blesses. He blesses the poor. He blesses the grieving. He blesses the persecuted. And they make a reappearance here, don't they? Jesus had interactions throughout the Gospel of Matthew that reinforce this relationally focused understanding of what it means to be a Jesus follower. And one instance that comes to mind is that young lawyer who came to Jesus when he was teaching and asked, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? In his own time, Dietrich Bonhoeffer put that statement under a lens and pointed out that the question is often just an excuse for simply doing nothing. When he was teaching, Jesus wasn't inviting an ethical discussion. He wasn't trying to start an argument about works or good deeds. And just as before, when we come to this final parable, the question resurfaces, what must I do? But in an importantly, very different way. Lord, when was it? that we saw you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you. It turns the question into something that's argumentative, a question that's self-justifying. Those at the left hand of the Son of Man look for an excuse and almost put the blame on the Son of Man himself, as if they were to say, you didn't reveal yourself. How could we possibly have known you? Very soon, in the next chapter after our reading today, Jesus will actually experience that list of things that we've been repeating. Jesus will experience all of those things that he names soon. In Gethsemane, Jesus will be sick with worry. He'll be sweating blood, and instead of caring for him, the disciples all fall asleep. Soon, Jesus will be held in prison, and the disciples will all stay away because of their fear. Soon, Jesus will be stripped of his clothing, and as he stands naked, the guards will play dice to see who gets what. Soon, Jesus will be treated like a stranger by his own disciples. Peter will deny him three times, and the other disciples will scatter. Soon, from the cross, Jesus will say, I thirst, and instead of water, he'll be given vinegar. I have bad news, friends. The bad news is that the judgment Jesus was talking about when he shared this parable, this judgment has already happened. It didn't go well. It didn't go well for the disciples. It didn't go well for humanity. It didn't go well for us. In fact, it was downright convicting. When we look back and see the actions of the disciples, when we see plainly that if it was a test and a moment of separating out sheep and goats, It makes me wonder whether there are any sheep at all. The Lutheran in me would say, there were no sheep at all. What a gift then, that we end up in a place in this gospel where it becomes clear that what ultimately matters to God here are these relationships. Most especially what matters is the relationship rooted in the self-giving love of Jesus. The most profound aspect of this whole scene is that the same question is repeated twice in the parable, once by those on the right, once by those on the left, and when spoken by each group, the meaning completely changes. When it's asked by those on the right, those sheep, the question casts a vision of what might be called holy ignorance. This gathering, it's full of people who have entered the joy of their master without even knowing it. In their day-to-day life, participation was not so clear and obvious. 
After all, the joy they received was not complete. Here and now, that joy is tinged by suffering, mixed with risk, full of tribulation, and most likely marked by many disappointments. And yet, Jesus calls it joy. They went the way of the cross because they had experienced the freedom that it gave them. They acted out of mercy because they wanted to receive mercy. They expressed their devotion to God by devoting themselves to their neighbors. And now they find themselves at the right hand of the Son of Man. And they're just as surprised as anyone else in that gathered assembly. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, we read about that relationship. Jesus invites us into this relationship that looks just like this. It looks like Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where rather than insisting on devotion, he brings blessings to the poor, to the meek, to the persecuted, and those hungering and thirsting for righteousness where they are and because they're there to be blessed. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, this relationship looks like the way that disciples and believers have come to live out their baptismal vocations. To hear the call to let their light shine before others that they may see, that all may see their good works and glorify their God who is in heaven, but because of that gift of baptism. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, it looks like the community that's sent out from the Lord's Supper as the body of Christ, only to discover that when they go out the doors, they're encountering the body of Christ there in the world too. In this vision and in our own call to discipleship, we find a calling, not just to a personal individual faith, but to a faith which leads us into community, into solidarity, and into life together. And in light of that call to the community that's born out of our life in Christ and mutual, in the mutuality that we share, I'll finish with this prayer for the morning by Audette Fulbright Folson. Pray with me. Did you rise this morning, broken and hung over with weariness and pain and rage tattered from waving too long in a brutal wind? Get up, child. Put your bones upright, gather your skin and muscle into a patch of sun. Draw a breath deep into your lungs. You will need it, for another day calls to you. I know you ache. I know you wish the work were done, and you with everyone you have ever loved were on a distant shore, safe and unafraid. But remember this. Tired as you are, you are not alone. Here and here and here also there are others weeping and rising and gathering their courage. You belong to them, and they to you, and together we will break through and bend the arc of justice all the way down into our lives. Thanks be to God, and may the peace of God that passes all human understanding keep our hearts and thoughts in the promises of Christ Jesus. Amen. Our hymn of the day is 634. We will sing verses 1, 5, and 6. Oh, uh-huh. 
Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial wall to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him. Let's right, confess we'll our to faith begin. together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's <laughs> only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's Spirit on the church the world, and all in need. Sovereign of all, train our ears to hear your cry in the needs of those around us, especially in these days of coronavirus and the many, many sisters and brothers who are suffering with the disease. Bless all social ministries of the church through which we seek to serve others as we ourselves have been served. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You cause rain to fall on the just and unjust alike. Direct our use of creation to provide for the needs of all people in ways that are sustainable for the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring peace to every place where conflict yeah, rages. Grant opportunities for ending divisions among us and usher in your reign of unity and reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heal the sinful divisions we erect between us and release us from systems of oppression and prejudice. Restore our capacity to see your image in those whose dignity we have diminished through our white privilege, especially indigenous people, those brought here against their will, and those marginalized based on ethnic or cultural differences. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pour out the gifts of your spirit on children and youth throughout the church, Sustain those who work in children's ministry, youth ministry, and campus ministry as they nurture the gifts of young people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. May God look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. The service continues with the hymn. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 